Thanks for that introduction, Sebas, and thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to present one of my chapters here at Tropic Lunch. Um, it's focused on large vertebrate conservation in multiple use forests. And I'm defining multiple use forests as forests where there's any kind of extractive activities going on. And why I really want to present to the Tropic Lunch audience is because I think there are policy implications. And I think it's things we've known already, but it's totally kind of coalescing kind of clear policy. So I'm really curious about your feedback in terms of how to communicate the results from this research to government officials and the kind of civil society NGOs that are driving this kind of policy policy conservation, specifically for large vertebrates. Um, in terms of format, please feel free to stop me anytime. I really appreciate that kind of interactive um, audience. Okay, sorry. So to kind of give you a start of like a broad picture, this is actually the current extent of tropical forest covering the world right now. And it's about a little over 700 million hectares. And this is what we call the intact forest cover. So there's more than 30% um, forest canopy closure in these 30 by 30 grid cells. And this is actually really cool. This is a, a global data set that is available on Earth Engine and you can actually download the shape files and extract out stuff from it. I thought it was amazing to have this available. So there's always this back and forth between conservation and conservationists and land use managers about how much area we need to allocate towards conservation and protection for biodiversity. And right now, so the blue areas are actually some sort of IUCN classification for protection. There's about a 50-50 distribution of protected areas um, against forests that are classified as some kind of extractive use. The majority being timber production. It's about 400 million hectares of forest. So all these blue areas are some level of like strictest category of protection where there's no anthropogenic um, disturbances versus like lower levels of some multiple use biosphere reserves as well. And th there's been a kind of evolving discussion in the literature about land sharing versus land sparing. And what I'm gonna be linking this towards is more kind of the land sharing aspect. Well, I consider it land sharing, but there's also confusion in the definition of land sharing and land um, sparing. Because I work primarily in logged forests, um, in managed forests where there is more extraction ongoing. And there have been more and more studies that have kind of been co coalescing in terms of what exactly are the impacts of logging on biodiversity in the tropics. So this was the most recent meta-analysis that was done that show that as logging intensity increases, you start losing more biodiversity. I think one of the kind of pivotal points along this axis of um, logging intensity is about 38 cubic meters per hectare, which is in the neotropics is about a little over 12 to 16 trees per hectare. So you start losing um, your amphibian species and your mammal species as you go beyond that level. Uh, other taxa like birds are a little bit harder to distinguish because you have uh, generalists that um, come into these new habitat types, but you also lose some specialist species. But what's crazy about this study, it actually, out of 48 studies that were assessing the impacts of logging, there was only one study in mammals. And actually it was large a threshold, large arboreal vertebrates, monkeys based primates. Um, so our knowledge gap about exactly what is allowing text on large vertebrates is kind of still existing. And so I'm hoping that this chapter of my thesis that work I've done is going to help kind of contribute towards that, answering that question. And the reason why we think logged forests are potentially compatible with conservation goals, so this is an example from a study we did in the Belize in 2015 where we mapped the harvest unit. And you'll notice the dark green areas that we call nada, which means not directly affected areas. So they actually <laughs> do not suffer any direct lying impacts. So these are the, the main roads for extraction, the um, skid trails and the log landings, like a temporary storage area. So there's a large portion where the canopy is still in, intact. There aren't that kind of um, concerns in terms of force fragmentation that degrades the the forest system services. However, logging is an independent activity. Roads. Roads is the first point of entry into the forest. And for some reason, which is kind of weird, I do not understand, in the Guyanese context especially, loggers are always the first ones to go into remote areas. It's not the miners. 
the miners follow the loggers because the roads are what the piece everything. So with the access, we have illegal hunting. So it's caused um, the, uh, increase in the illegal bushmeat trade. We have the miners that come in. So this is actually an image from Gan as well uh, that part of the grades of forest. And as these kind of progression of activities are occurring, the value of the forest is slowly being degraded. So a mine forest has substantially less timber value as well than a forest that's only been logged once. Um, yeah. you, you, the point you made about the loggers build the roads and the miners follow, that's, that's interesting because I don't think that's true everywhere because in many places the petroleum exploration people build the roads but but I'm not sure that those roads have as much of a secondary impact on on, on deforestation and hunting as the logging roads maybe because they're not so well constructed or not used for so long or, so but think, it's an odd it's an odd observation so I think part of it is associated with land tenure because in forest concessions, your tenure right is above ground. Whereas in mining rights, your rights are below ground. So you actually do, so when you go into mine an area, you have no right to sell that wood you're removing. Basically, you just trash it because you're not authorized to extract log, log revenues on. And I think with the petroleum, because it's, it's such an industry that is restrictive, I think, because of technology, maybe that's how they're excluding these gold, artisanal gold miners from those bars, would be my best guess. But the profit margins from mining are, are so much higher yeah. than from forestry, you'd think it, yeah. they'd have the money to build the roads, and yet... They need not. a first access for something. They need a first main artery. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't quite understand why. And as, so as, as you slowly degrade these additional ecosystem values, you get to this stage where the highest land value is actually full scale conversion, where it is not possible either with no provisioning service and for those bars. And so, trying to come back to the defoliation issue and overhunting, which I'll link to the study a little bit later, is, is that this is becoming a, a big worry for us. And I'm sure many of you have heard the empty forest syndrome scenario, where the loss of dispersers are going to have trophic cascade effects on the recruitment and continued existence of a large population of tree species um, in the tropics. And this has knock-on effects in terms of uh, carbon sequestration. So an example is in the forest that I study in Ghana, more than 80% of the tree species are dispersed by animals and their large seeded species, high wood density. On average, they store over 200 um, tons of carbon per so there is serious trophic cascading effects. There's also the human components. So a lot of indigenous communities depend on wild meat for subsistent um, livelihood activities. So there's a lot of like linkages that are going on because of this continuing deformation crisis. So when we set out uh, to assess the impacts of logging and hunting, and I think that's where the big problem has been with these previous research on logging, it's hard to partition what exactly is attributable to logging versus the synergistic impacts associated with um, illegal hunting and colonization. So we wanted to know whether the hunting increased in the logged forest areas, uh, what were the community level effects of um, hunting on, on logging on large animals. So and we tried to partition this out with uh, multiple species of animals. So we wanted to account explicitly for the process of detecting animals versus the ecological um, actually the interest, whether a species is there. Um, and then we wanted to ask about effect of hunting intensity, uh, sorry, and species richness in logged and unlogged forests. So where there's an actual reduction in the biodiversity at the sites. So coming back to this kind of uh, forest global forest distribution, um, just in case you don't know, this is Guyana, Northern <laughs> South America. And it's part of this special unique geographic area in northern Amazon that is actually distinct from the central and east and west Amazon. It's called the Guyana Shield Peak region. And it includes Guyana, Suriname, um, French Guyana, and parts of Venezuela and Colombia, and uh, northern Brazil. And so I worked for a long time in this sustainable use reserve called the International Center. 
that's located in the center of Ghana, and it was established after the Rio summit. Uh, it was all these lofty goals of showing sustainable use of tropical forests for development, um, and it's ongoing. And there's been successes and lots of failures, lessons learned. Um, so this is the boundary of Yorokrama, and it's about 300,000 hectares of forest. It's been zoned into what we call uh, wilderness reserves, so the WPs, and areas that are called sustainable utilization areas. And within this reserve itself, there's a titled indigenous community um, that's located within this, this protected, kind of quasi-protected area. So this zoning process ensures that every biological, unique biological forest type or some kind of cultural attribute is representative in this wilderness preserve where there are no anthropogenic disturbances except for traditional indigenous activities. And in the SUA, there is extractive industries. So there is timber, not in forest products extraction, tourism based activities. Um, yeah. What's the other part that's not labeled? Uh, this, sorry, this, this is the WP as well. The wilderness preserve. I, I don't know why I didn't come up with a label. And, and the, one of the interesting about this reserve is actually it suffers from a road that bisects it in the <coughs> middle. And this is the part of the Inter-American Highway that eventually that connects to Brazil and is going to be eventually paved as well. However, Eurocrama has the unique ability that it controls, it has two checkpoints that controls access in and out of the reserve. So if you enter the reserve, there's a ranger station that calls ahead and tells them when they expect you. So if you're not on time, then patrols to check that you're not engaged in any kind of illegal hunting or activities. Um, so because this is a sustainable use reserve, there have been lots, lots, lots of investment in the long-term research work. In 2007 to 2011, part of a broader livelihood study in the Amazon with the Makushi tribe of um, Northern Brazil and Southern Guyana, they were accessed assessing subsistence livelihood of Kushmi trade. So we have spatial information of uh, the hunting sites that this community, um, basically sites that community is hunted in across three year period. So we have the species that was hunted, how many species, uh, it was spatially mapped onto the map. Um, so we used this information to kind of build our first base map. So we wanted to uh, quantify hunting across this multiple use landscape. So we created a 400 meter by 400 meter grid cells and we used the uh, observed hunt across this 21 month survey period. And by the way, all of this information was collected by indigenous people, the community um, power biologists. And so we quantified uh, Basically, what was the predictors of hunting intensity across the landscape? And it turned out that distance from the village was the strongest indicator of your hunting intensity. And we tested things like river, distance to river, um, distance to the nearest main artery of roads. But in the end, this was the best fit model. So this is what we come up with. So we come up with a spatial kind of mapping of where the hotspots of hunting is happening. So you can see the community is located here. It likes to hunt along the river primarily, which makes sense. It's a river and community that's using the, the main river artery to access hunt sites. And as you go away from the village, your hunt intensity decreases. So the majority of the hunting is occurring within 10 kilometer of the village. And that's kind of the knowledge that we know of, uh, which is really good to find. Uh, but this also, uh, this kind of clustering of hunting is potentially hinting at other <coughs> kind of processes that are going on. So, so there's obviously some preferred hunt sites that hunters are frequent, frequenting more often and probably hints at sourcing dynamics that are occurring within this forest as well. Yeah. For clarification, when you say hunting, is hunting so the hunting data set uh, contained over 20 something species. <laughs> so majority of everything, but excluding carnivores was the main one that was in the species list. And consumption. 
everything was mine. Um, um, so we don't quantify what was used or what was um, sold. We're just quantifying the hunting extraction across the landscape. Yeah, across the landscape. So, and then we fused this with a camera trap study that we were curious about how is the large bird being affected by the logging. But here is a situation where we can use a separate data set to also partition the hunting effect from the logging effect. So this is the sustainable forest management unit in Iram, this broken line. It's about 600 hectares of a sample area. And we had 27 camera traps here for about 30 to 33 days. And then above it, which is our uh, unlocked forest, is where we sample for biodiversity using the same kind of methodology of camera traps. As well. And we had about 26 sites here. And just the, uh, this is just the hunting rate. This is just like the intensity of hunt. And the camera traps get a little bit cool pictures. This is an ocelot on a logging road, a giant armadillo that's huge, uh, pumas with her cub, tapirs, um, and pirates. And very tasty bird for herself. <laughs> So we combined our hunting, that hunting information from the grid cells with our camera trap data. So this is just basically whether a probability species detected is binary, so it's one or zero. Um, and we have these parameters to capture <coughs> the effect of the logging, whether the movement is a dummy variable, if one is log, and zero is an odd forest, and the effect of the hunting um, on our occupancy rates. And what we found was actually that logging had a positive effect on both the detection process, the actual observation, and the ecological process of interest, which is occupancy. And how we would define occupancy is that with your detection, you don't necessarily, so you might not detect a species, but it does not necessarily mean that species is absent from that site. So this occupancy is accounting for that non-detection, but still a probability of that species of finding that site. Whereas uh, hunting reduced both detection and an occupancy, but both of them are non significant effects as well. So these are community level parameters. So though our um, multi-species model actually is able to piece apart species of effects, we kind of found these together to the community level um, Mm -hmm. So how you can interpret this is that if the lines cross is zero, it's non-significant. So the wide bars are the 95% credible intervals and the kind of greater thicker bars are the intervals. Whereas we found that hunting, as hunting rate increased, it led to over 2% decline in um, your probability of finding that species at the site. So this is, this is all the species we found. There are about 17 large terrestrial vertebrates. And I should have said this, when I say large terrestrial vertebrates, I mean they're above one kg. So things like a, I don't know, kind of BT, it's like five, six kg, it's kind of nature sense. We also found that species richness though the, the credible intervals are overlapping, was actually higher in the log forest. So we found an average 10 species, whereas in the, sorry, 11, whereas in the uh, unlocked forest, we found eight species. So this is predicted species, which is at the different sites at camera traps. So it's pulling that information again. Similarly, we also found that species diversity declined substantially at the highest level. So you were only finding maybe at the highest observed level in that itself. Right. So the check, kind of just to get back to the broader context of how what was being implemented in Rupama. So the Rupama site implements uh, reduced impact logging, so it's low intensity logging that's occurring with trained fellers, um, trained personnel. It was certified, so it had FSC certification as responsibly managed, especially during the study period. 
um, and it was able to control non-sanctioned activities. So it had these co management protocols with the community that included agricultural expansion of lands, um, hunting regulations, uh, what else? And was able to control access in and outside of the reserve as well. The other thing that I personally I felt was very important for this biodiversity biodiversity outcome was this idea of the zonation of the forest. So you had these production landscapes of around here where we've been long, but it's nested within this broader matrix of strictly protected areas, um, as well as well managed areas. So you can have an opportunity of it, even though there's depletion or impacts of logging on vertebrates here, there's still kind of refugees in that broader landscape matrix for them to go away and then turn back. The other big thing um, that Yokama has perpetually been involved with since its inception is this bringing the communities into the process as well. So there's been ongoing education research so the community is actually feel part of Actually, they own it. They own this process. So they're so they're also doing their own monitoring <coughs> interventions to stop illegal activity. Well. So it's many eyes. The other thing that Yokama has managed to do is move these communities from just being stakeholders in a process to actually shareholders in the business. So they're getting, based on the money generated from the logging, they're actually getting a percentage of the profits for it not necessarily profits, but fixed among their paid on top of, um, I guess, bringing on the top of your investment, like what's it called in stock markets when you get a turn? Dividend. Dividends. So there's basically a dividend. So in this case, we have uh, the business part of which is the tripartite um, partnership that's occurring with this logging. So it's a business entity that actually has the capital and how to do the logging. EOPRAM is a scientific why that has rights and the kind of scientific knowledge to implement these um, improved logging methods. Whereas the communities have traditionally owned this forest land, they have this local ecological knowledge of like where are the most productive forest lands, um, how our species will respond. So, and we call this the three-legged stool and actually was, this concept is owned, well, came up from an indigenous community from, from within the Yokam forest as well. So, okay. so this is the things they're trying to move towards to. The other thing is the access of closing these managed forest units. So you have up to this point in time where, well, where either colonizers and illegal hunters are entering into the concession for the depleting the wildlife and biodiversity versus and you end up with this scenario that I talked about earlier. So you have slow encroachment that is removed by diversity and services of the forest. Whereas if there's road closure and subsequent restriction and improved management, you can potentially maintain that biodiversity volume by the next cutting cycle. But there's still like lots of questions as well as what's gonna happen beyond the second and third cutting cycle in terms of biodiversity conservation as well. So in terms of the policy recommendations and linking it to what we found is that low intensity logging did not have a negative effect on wildlife. Actually, we found that logging had a positive effect on occupancy by 8% and detection by 2%. And that could be um, associated with education and outreach for forestry workers. So one of the problems with many logging companies is the of forestry workers. And forestry workers themselves exert a substantial amount on um, wildlife species because of bushmeat hunting. So none of the workers are allowed to hunt. There is that kind of gray area where workers are indigenous, and so it can get potential conflict. But you promise me, manage somehow to minimize that conflict of when there's indigenous workers that they can hunt. It's very separate. The forest zoning, the create that kind of exclusion, sustainable use area versus the wilderness preserve. The third party <laughs> certification is the high standards of logging. So and I think this is important because me just saying I'm doing uh, good forest management is not sufficient. That kind of third um, 
review standard that I think is very important. And it's basically peer review in kind of academic comparison. The other one is the hunting could potentially degrade wildlife. And I think this hints at where our resources should be going. So even though there was subsistence hunting, there was still a negative effect, though non-significant. So in terms of controlling access to include non-sanctioned hunting and those kind of continuing building those community partnerships for effective wildlife management, population management, I think is important. Um, and another thing, think, just thinking beyond this study is, we just ass assess presence and absence, but it has nothing to do with viable population type. And I think that's a where studies like this is going. Yeah, the species are still there, but are they viable genetically in terms of long-term population stability as well? Okay. In your opinion, what would you explain that? Because you got 80% more, and in theory, they're similar sites, right? So what would you explain, how do you explain get more in the places that people are not interested in? You, you think more? it's a skill respect, so they don't and inside the logging, so they go outside and hunt So, I mean, so yeah, I'll just pull that map up. Yeah. So, there could be two things going on here. So, this is self reported So, they're telling us where they're hunting. And for an ongoing period of time, Europama has had this policy of we're not hunting in the logged forest. So, I think they're potential confusion for that as indigenous communities who are willing partners in this as kind of interpreting as they shouldn't hunt in the lot forest as well. But there's still there's a still few of hunt there were still hunting episodes in the lot forest, but I suspect there are people are deliberately avoiding those forests or they're under reporting those forests, those hunt sites as well. Um, the other thing of why we could why we might have found more Protections and occupancy is so logging creates this kind of open, a more open structure of canopy. So you have all this the large uh, carnivores, the jaguars, um, the peers, and pumas love the woods. So that's where most of our detections were, were occurred. Um, so in the log forest, we had like 18 times more detections of jaguars and pumas than in on log forest. So it just could be that the visibility is higher. They're using roads. There couldn't be changes in the food resources. So there were also more insectivorous um, species. So uh, armadillos and coatis in the lot forest as well. So there could be a change in abundance. All that. Yeah. How are they so this is all traditional hunting. They're they're shotguns, but they're ricocheted shot like ricochet. They're together. Um, <laughs> home, homemade. Homemade, yeah. So because so uh, access to legal guns is and most of them are probably unlicensed gun holders as well. Um, but the majority of it is bow and arrow, still very traditional and subsistent. And, and snaring, not Snaring is not very common in these forests, in these communities, in terms of hunting. Well, I wonder why. Is that a cultural tradition? or? I would say it's not a cultural tradition. I think born and Iris people are more familiar with. And are there animals that they uh, baby hunt that prohibition? <laughs> so there, traditionally, there have been taboos against certain species, of, against hunting certain species, but those taboos are not longer there. Yeah. So I, I assume that so that they have logging camps mm -hmm. and workers stay out and logging. So they bring in meat like chicken and things yeah. like that. And, and so somehow they're able to convince the recording that the channel comes logging. And so I, I'm just curious about they are successful at doing that. They're, in Cassidy, bring people out to help you know, size and find or around and things like that. And they have the same person. Oh, yeah. Regardless, right? So, so for some reason, these, these education 
program or maybe they're more accustomed to eating chicken and I think it's a combination of both. So I've been on forest inventory because we're in beef months and eventually we, we transitioned to which meat as their source of protein. But because of this road, there are regular shipments of chicken. So there's always meat. And there's a cultural thing of like having to have meat in every meal. So by that, by this road, they're, built, they're able to supply their field camps with, with um, fresh meat, fresh sources of cheap protein that's not bush meat. So I think that's been important for kind of that. Um, yeah. And besides that, the, the forest boundary is there like a subdivision or like animal hunting areas? Yeah. What do you uh, read that? Because I don't know, maybe like one part of the forest boundary is like non or for a long time. So all of the logging in this um this forest management that actually contains several blocks. The block harvest blocks are hundred acres of our smallest um, timber management units. So uh, the logging occurred between 2007 when it started and 2011 when when the the hunting study ended as well. But because uh, we considered all of it still active, because even though they were logging at this point, they were tra traversing the earlier sections that they thought to get there. And actually, in some cases, what we in when we log forest is we start from the farthest forest management. So we start logging here, and then we progressively go down as well. Um, so I don't think that was a big issue of the timeline of logging because there were still people passing and using throughout the management unit. There was still extraction. And most of the chicken is coming from the as well. <laughs> it's coming from down up because it's a shorter uh, uh, distance and chicken is and small. Didn't you say that they had a down? I mean, so there's a difference between hunting to put meat in your every meal, yeah. every meal yeah. versus chicken. And there's still that cultural association. So as soon as you leave here and you go to the village, there's someone that has a pot going with tuma, which is like meat and castry. So you can always have. But so I was actually assistant forest manager while this happened, um, 2007 to 2011. And I'm pretty sure that the hunting, I'm sure there is incidences of hunting by the forestry workers, but it wasn't pervasive because we were constantly present. So part of the agreement that Iroquama has in the management of the forest is we're responsible for monitoring and enforcement. So we're always out there. We have a tour of forest rangers that are not involved in the logging, but are specific for monitoring of the forest. So I think that constant presence of people around definitely forestry workers hunting. Um, and, all, and that cultural, I mean, I eat wild meat, but I don't <laughs> demand it in every meal. Um, so there's yeah. that cultural association that's still mm -hmm. going there. Um, but I think out of between the logging and the hunting, I think we need to focus a lot more on active management and that extraction because, and we actually did a power analysis to see how, you know, how confident we were in our data. And we found that with our uh, hunting, with our logging data, that our model was more likely to make an incorrect prediction of detecting a larger negative effect than a positive. 
So we are very, we are very confident that lobbying is just causing negative effects here. But if you look at the, I mean, they're not significant, but it hints at a process that could potentially quickly degrade um, life. But to play devil's kind of yeah. advocate, do you really have a control system? Because, I mean, how can you say that logging doesn't have a negative effect unless you have something that's far removed from logging, far removed from hunting? Yeah, so that's a good point. So, so this is just one study. and. <laughs> And that's the kind of precautionary tale. It's, you know, it suffers from that pseudo replication. It's only one uh, management scenario. So that's why I'm more interested in linking it to these kind of, but well, what are the policy contexts that led us finding this positive biodiversity outcome? I mean, and the thing is about the controlled forests, I, I showed a map of the primal forest and the zonation. So, there's a reason why they created this these wilderness reserves as well. And there's a specific monitor for research. So everything they do in the SUA has to be mirrored in terms of monitoring in the wilderness reserve. So this would have been a perfect uh, controlled site. Fortunately, the wilderness reserves were also designed to be farthest away from, from the from accessible uh, parts of the concession to minimize that anthropogenic disturbance. So because of our limitation of, of resources, we just kind of stuck it to the, the log forest and a kind of a buff community buffer area where no logging is allowed, but indigenous communities are going to use the forest as we're not. I guess my point is, I think, you know, when you talk about it, you might want to be a little careful. Yeah. Just saying, certainly relative to yeah. this. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Well, what about your absolute your estimates of absolute density of, of big cats that you can recognize as individuals. So yeah, actually that's a great point. So the cool thing about the camera traps is that some species, because of their special coat patterns, so like jaguars and tapirs actually, because of their, their scarring, we could identify individuals. So we did a spatial analysis and we found that the density, and because jaguars occupy 100 square kilometers, and these areas are like 6,000, 6,000 hectares. We basically pulled everything together. We were like, this is the entire multiple forest. What's the density of these um, carnivores? And they were actually the same as strictly protected area for the rest of the Americas. So that was one of the, one of the things we were trying to piece together in terms of, okay, well, this is our site. You're suffering from slow replication. But how does specific to these <coughs> animal species that you can identify individuals, how does it match up to other sites? And it matches up pretty well. There's lower density, not within the range, but there's slightly lower density for jaguars, but that can be associated with the kind of shield that is able to harbor lower um, vertebrate biomass or well, well, because of the kind of shield white sand is about. <laughs> It's interesting when you have red traps on you encounter people, I think, other things do that. Oh, so we, we spoke to people, so before we even saw the cameras, we had consultations. sure they were okay with it. had consultations with the forest tree personnel as well and the forest workers. Um, we only had fun stuff of them dressing up and falling. <laughs> But um, nothing serious. I know Matt has had issues of people stealing cameras, but I just had a better relationship with like this. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't suffer anything. Or less, thanks, exposed in that. I mean, um, when your camera started, it was flush with uh, GIF, GIF, uh, global environment. Yeah, so, yeah, there was tons of money that they were given to build this kind of foundational research. I don't know how expensive it is. Um, they're definitely working on a shoestring budget now. That's all that money kind of tied up for kind of being reallocated. And so they're still doing skeleton 
Excelco can outreach and education and stuff. And part of the success is the ability that it has had the ability to embed its staff within the community. Um, so like the community outreach partner coordinator lives. Um, so in the south of Iwakrama, the Iwakrama forest, um, so in the south there is about 15 other indigenous species that has traditionally used the forest. So the community outreach board is actually getting it. So she lives here. And she's been working for like decades. So that institutional kind of knowledge and carry on and relationships are very hard in continuing to carry forward. But I'm sure it's cost tons. And I think there's actually someone who value social kind of the kind of wildlife clubs they started initiated. So a lot of those people, when your program started in 1998, it initiated these wildlife uh, clubs. And those, those kids are actually moved up the position of like the head of the community village council, the reared to shelter captain. So they've been instilled this kind of environment consciousness that they are now, I think your program has been able to draw from that goodwill that you know, invested years and years ago. Even though it doesn't have a same. So, and so one of the reasons I've been kind of grappling it and even just trying to put together this presentation is how do you present this information and get by it? Because for me, this is like a precautionary. So there's not necessarily bad outcomes or horrible outcomes that lead from these kind of policy intervention. But how do you get people, um, or at least test them in other places, so you can go beyond one site? So I, that's why I'm grappling with like how now to move this study into like a policy context to communicate. Share with them. So, if you guys have comments or recommendations and how to go about that process, really appreciate it. Yeah, that's okay. Okay. The what? The Zoom. Zoom. Mm -hmm. So, the zoning um, was done by, with the community. So, there, there were 16 communities that actually came for us. <laughs> so it was done by a combination of uh, cultural and social values relations with these actual biophysical um, space of biodiversity and forest types. That's part of where the big money was spent as well. There was a lot of biophysical mapping at that stage. Um, and it's a well-documented zoning process. At the very to follow up on that, you said there's a, a bunch of villages that are down so, along the road, yeah. right? But there's no sustainable use area that looks like very accessible. Or are there other things outside of So they can use better? everything. They can use everything. They can use everything. So they're legally guaranteed use rights and access rights. There's no restriction on indigenous use. There have been um, discussions and consultations to develop uh, things like agricultural expansion because there's a clear like print forest in terms of forest cover loss. So they've managed to spatially plant those in the southern part of the forest actually. So there's actually community with farms and stuff in the, in the forest. Um, but yeah, they're complete access to it, no restriction. Yeah. Well, 
I, unfortunately, so what, one of the reasons your panel was able to exclude people is it has legal rights over the entire forest. <laughs> Whereas in the forestry concessioning system, there is these overlapping land tenure reviews. So I can be given a forest concession and, and CFAS is given a mining concession on top of mine. So I cannot exclude him, he cannot exclude me. We're actually different kind of degradation process. So there is that ongoing bigger problem of compatible land use management. Well, you had a question? Oh. Yeah. That's all I have for you guys. Thank you. Thank you.